it's a pleasure to have the opportunity to introduce Joanna Drucker. If I'm not mistaken, the last time I saw Joanna was in January 2010, when I sat next to her in the auditorium at the New York Public Library as she was about to receive the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Printing History Association. I don't remember when I first met Joanna, but I do know that it must have been at the University of Virginia, whether I was introduced to her by Jerry McGann, who I think was still part of IAF then, or by Terry Bellinger, then director of Rare Book School, I cannot say. Two more different people, both brilliant in their own way, are difficult to imagine, but it's a mark of Joanna's own brilliance that it might have been either one. The last time I saw Joanna here in Austin was in June 2006, when I spent an hour and a half with her viewing the technologies of writing exhibition at the HRC. Right. Needless to say, I learned a lot. I was going to welcome her back to Austin, but I can only do it. <laughs> <laughs> Joanna Drucker is the Martin and Bernhard Breslauer Professor of Bibliography in the Department of Inter Information Studies at UCLA. She has a BFA degree from the California College of Arts and Crafts and a doctorate from Berkeley. Before leaving UVA to join the faculty at UCLA, she taught many places, not just UT Dallas, but also Harvard, Columbia, and Yale. She is widely published on typography, artist books. She is herself an experienced printer and renowned book artist, alphabet historiography, digital aesthetics, and the history of visual information design. While she was at UVA, she was co-founder of Special Lab, Spec Lab, which became home to a number of experimental projects with uncertain outcomes that were intent on contesting, as she writes, the emerging convictions of the digital humanities community. Spec Lab, Digital Aesthetics and Projects in Speculative Computing, 2009, is the title of her most recent book. We look forward to hearing her talk tonight, which is entitled Humanist Computing at the End of the Individual Voice. It's true that I've spent quite a bit of time um, in the last decade uh, trying to think about ways to introduce humanistic methods into uh, computational work. And um, that's taken the form, really, of trying to suggest that we do have methods, not just content, that we want to bring um, into the digital environment. But the question I'm going to ask tonight is whether or not this whole undertaking will still have any relevance at all um, if the notion of the individual is subsumed within a new formation of the hive mind and the social swarm. First slide. The host of a radio talk show that I listen to um, often uh, recently said that she'd gotten about 25,000 postings on her blog. But she said, we'd really like to have 50,000, and she was encouraging listeners to post. Now, I'm sure that these numbers translate into something, whether it's revenue or increased subventions or status or job security, but surely at that scale, these individual posts aren't being read. So I was trying to figure out what would be the motivation for writing such a post. And I have to admit that an incredible sense of futility just washed over me at the prospect. I just had this awful sense that individual communication just doesn't even matter anymore, that, that everything we do is just a, a data point in a really large set. Well, in 2004, Clive Thompson posted a piece in Slate, and it's already a long time ago, um, titled Art Mobs. And it posed the question, can an online crowd create a poem, a novel, or a painting? Now, he was citing what the still new wiki as an instance of collaborative authorship. And he was saying, oh, this is working really well. It's enabled by online platforms. Um, but he contrasted this kind of group creativity with mob behavior, such as bringing down governments through popular uprisings. Now, recent events um, closer to our time testify to the power of social networking to galvanize this kind of action and coordinate real-time strategic interventions. Um, and we know that this is true to an unprecedented degree. But I think we still make a difference between the body politic and the aesthetic realm. And my sense is that there's something about art that remains a part. It remains a kind of privileged realm. And that we cling to a notion of art um, in various ways that still, bears the hall, uh, that still bears the hallmarks of very long traditions. 
or do we? And that's the question. What if we are, in fact, indeed, at the end of the era of the individual voice? And what if the works of art that we're singing, seeing coming out of new conceptual traditions, and I'll talk about those in a minute, as well as those that are sustained by online platforms that aggregate and synthesize contributions into mass collectivity, are actually bellwethers of a change? And what would that mean for the ways we think about humanism and the ways we think about humanity's computing? Next slide. In her current study of writing in the uncreative vein, unoriginal genius, Marjorie Perloff begins with the discussion of the reception of T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. She notes that it was disdained as a collection of fragments of found, exhumed, recombined, and referenced language, and that the poem was basically dismissed as what we would now call a mashup. In other words, it was anathema to the cult of the lyric voice. Now, Eliot's essay, Tradition and the Individual Talent, is the title of which I referenced in my talk title, makes clear the grounds on which poetic composition, in his opinion, necessarily drew on the knowledge of the work of others. And though he didn't go as far as current conceptual writers, his modern tendencies exposed the double-sided myth of originality, that it was generative and combinatoric, but not autonomous or independent of sources and influence. In measured and careful tones, Eliot remarks, our tendency is to insist when we praise a poet upon those aspects of his work in which he least resembles anyone else, where in fact, he goes on to say, we shall often find that not only the best, but the most individual parts of his work may be those in which the dead poets, his ancestors, assert their immortality most vigorously. Next slide. Now, uncreative writing, for those of you unfamiliar with it, is an extreme extension of Eliot's approach. If we can take Kenny Goldsmith's remark, no need to write anything else, just manage the language we already have, as a restatement of the tenets of the modernist essay. But to get to that place with justification that goes beyond mere glib maneuvering, we're going to need a little bit of backup. And the process-based work of conceptualism attaches a great deal of currency to authorship, an authorial identity, and again, this is a sort of paradox. The individual may or may not embrace the notion of talent or originality. As Charles Bernstein wittily remarks, I like originality so much I keep imitating it. But the notable practitioners of conceptual work identify as branded named authors, and that's unmistakable. So they're not going away. Um, Kenny Goldsmith can take the text of the day of the New York Times as the basis of his book Day, and Carolyn Bergvall, whose uh, piece you see a snippet of on the screen, can find 40-some variant translations of the opening lines of Dante's Inferno and assemble them into a poetic text without composing a single phrase. But the authorial intent of their compositional acts not only attaches to their names and identities, but provides the same leverage for, pro pro for their professional stature as other practices in other times or veins. Now, I happen to like this work. And so I have no issue with it. Um, but my point here is that new conceptualism's unoriginality and uncreativity erase individual expression um, at the level of composition in one high art zone whose lineage also tracks back to Dada and other early avant-garde modernisms. At the same time that we see in the broader cultural sphere the leveling of individual, a leveling of individuality that's become conspicuous in other kinds of art practices. So I'm not sure what to make of this coincidence. Um, uh, maybe it's a symptom of a larger systemic shift. Um, maybe it's simply an uncanny harmonic convergence within a poetic ecology. But that's one of the questions for us to think about. Next slide. The phenomenon, it should be a million monkeys, yeah? Okay. Um, the phenomenon of collective art production has received a major boost with network technology. A Million Monkeys is a site that describes its activities as part choose your own adventure and part exquisite corpse in a fine combination of children's diversion and surrealistic activity, and the graphics pretty much uh, indicate that as well. Now, it's a lot less interactive than a moo or a mud, but it allows participants to add branches to existing tales, to build on each other's narratives, and the reference to the combinatoric gamble for the production of Shakespeare by the massive number of simian inputs is a pretty good rhyme with the procedural work of new conceptualism. 
even if the vector of creativity runs in the opposite direction. Conceptualism empties creative work of any impulse towards originality, while the million monkeys paradigm suggests that enough collaborative composition, however random, might add up to a masterwork. Next slide. But if the authors in the monkey writing mill remain identifiable, they have their little online handles, their stories get intertwined in a primary school space of pseudo-egalitarian, we all share nicely mode, other collaborative spaces eliminate the signs of authorship behind avatars and screen names, devices of fiction and illusion, as is the case of multiple uh, multiplayer online games and this particular version, which is a kind of uh, collaborative novel creation, Orion's Arm. Now, this Galactica, Metallica, sci-fi, space opera fiction has a lot in common with the game world. But the emergent whole, as in those environments, is a product of collective collaboration. So it's a world that emerges, and not a single, single player's view or author's view or vision. And you can't really extract the individual expression from the whole. So it's a little bit different than A Million Monkeys. Next slide. Now, other experiments in group art production um, have been more and or less successful. This is a particularly um, uninteresting one, I have to say. It's, um, it's an interface for shared decision making. And the aggregation of choices made by individuals sort of shows up in the image on display. So the formal expression of the work is the result of the will of the flock, as it were. But since nobody really cares what Lynch to look at these works, I'm not sure it actually matters. All right, next slide. <laughs> so another unsuccessful project is this autoerotic site. I don't try to describe it and keep a straight face. The idea was to gather images posted by women of themselves engaged in quote unquote self-pleasuring and then subject these little snippets to a kaleidoscopic, a kaleidoscopic effect to abstract them into a mandala pattern as an object of aesthetic rather than erotic contemplation. Um, the number of contributions to this site is very low, suggesting that the thrill of seeing one's fragmented body parts multiplied into a hypnotizing hippie pattern did not go viral. <laughs> so, though collaborative and anonymous, um, this is collective only by virtue of the addition of one contribution after another rather than through aggregation. And that's an important point um, uh, for the what lies ahead. Okay, next slide. Now, true aggregate work is slightly different from this. It absorbs individual contributions and either effaces their distinctions, their distinctions through processing the input into a single data stream or by turning the unique elements into a piece among so many that the identity is overwhelmed, as is um, the case in this mosaic of, of breast cancer patients. Um, this is similar in some ways to the, uh, the vast AIDS quilt. So again, these things don't have to be um, electronic. Um, and other works of witness or testimonial. So what's interesting about this is there's the presence of each individual face or name or mark actually re re retains its value within the whole. So an individual can actually link to that experience. There's a kind of unique point of identification um, that provides a kind of cathexis. Um, so there, you know, someplace in, in that group of images, that photograph, that star in the firmament is mine. It's me. So the individual voice here gains from its place within the whole. Um, it's part of something larger and more forceful, and it's reassuring by virtue of the communal experience. But again, it's absorbed and subsumed. Next slide. Now, this concept of the shared collective and communal is the thin edge of the hive mind, showing its peculiar and unfamiliar human face. Scientists who study emergent behaviors of hives and swarms note the peculiar properties of the colony in its coordinated but undirected actions. So this is still somewhat of a mystery to the people who look at ants and bees and, and so forth. Um, because no single part of this, what they call a superorganism, is in control. But the group actually acts in consort, and a whole emerges that has an identity and capacity for action independent of the individual parts. Precisely how this works, or why it happens, is unclear. And theories of complex bootstrap systems bootstrapping and emergent sentience have a cultish allure, but they may or may not be adequate explanations. 
And what we observe in the insect and animal kingdoms may reflect some chemical processes of communication and coordination that humans may or may not be subject to under certain circumstances. We really just don't know. Next slide. But the time for such speculation seems to be upon us, in fact. <clears throat> the my in the title of this piece, Out My Window, though linked to each individual frame, blurs its relation to any one person's point of view, especially as the whole notion of shared outlook is central to its ethos. Um, so who is my in this case? So the singular stands for the, for the shared. And the premise here is that the shared experience will give us common ground as social beings, taking us beyond the petty limits of strife-inducing political identities. Next slide. Now, um, this is a really ugly slide. The, the rapid emergence of social networking as a phenomenon is now well beyond initial stages of recognition. Um, and people write volumes and volumes and volumes about it. Um, the promotion of collective and collaborative writing practices within school environments is evidence of the extent to which shared upload activities are perceived as a norm rather than an anomaly. This is a site with instructions for how to get tweens to write collaboratively, you know, in school assignments. <clears throat> So the question that presses is whether the rate and volume of networked communication, um, uh, the increase, um, is merely bringing about changes of scale, or whether there's actually a substantive shift in our character and identity. If I look at younger, highly wired individuals, I do sense that a changed condition of humanness is coming about. They do live a kind of group mind and hive behavior. They're in <coughs> communication and contact. Um, they, don't, they don't see a conflict between that and having an interior life. And in fact, it's the fact of communi being in communication, not the substance of communication, that reassures them. They need that kind of continual um, flow. Next slide. Now, a site like Dumpster, um, with its uh, chocolate-toned graphics and its sweet script reminiscent of Valentine's and love letters, it's a really wonderful demonstration of this kind of aggregation engine at the service of individual life. The shared experience of being dumped, you know, let go, dismissed by a sweetheart, is thrown into this huge collective trash bin of the pond name of the site. And this display of heartaches bouncing around like so many pong balls and hot lottery soup turns individual sadness into collective play. Next slide. The result in Dumpster um, is rather better than, this, um, uh, th than it was in this typophile hive, where they tried to do collaborative drawing and writing. First, they tried to do a collaborative font design. Um, the level of processing is a whole lot higher in Dumpster than it was in typophile. Typophile is an earlier piece, um, where it was a kind of pixel-by-pixel pixel, um, choice that people could make when they logged on. Um, the individual efforts were supposed to go towards a single common goal. So this was a shared type design project that optimized at about 5,000 participants, but it tended to go astray above that number. So how many cooks is too many? The dumpster site, um, site's algorithmic mode absorbs all the individuals into a common soup. It doesn't really pit them against each other like so many electrons all yoked to a single wagon and trying to make headway in all these different directions along a set course. So when the properties of the project are engineered to maximize the possibilities of emergence, as in the case of Dumpster, rather than simply combine elements or aggregate a whole from individual parts, as in the case of the typophile or the one million um, images, the systemic quality of group identity starts to take on very different properties. Next slide. <laughs> So emergence, I would suggest, is not the, form, not the same as other forms of collaboration. Biblical and classical texts have their authorial attributes, and we can trace these as if they are so many identity isotopes, um, uh, uh, track them through stylometric analysis or linguistic study. In the current collaborative book I'm working on with um, uh, 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 Jeffrey Schnapp and Todd Presner, Peter Lunenfeld, and Ann Burdick, you can be sure we're going to put those little isotopes into our writing just to see, you know, who did, who did which phrases in the book. Um, but the convergence of authorial intention in these works, um, uh, biblical and classical texts, um, the convergence of authorial intention is much more incidental and ad hoc than deliberate. It's not as if, you know, writer J and writer K set out to do the Bible as a collaborative work. Um, 
only as the mode of groupthink becomes enabled within networked environments, um, electronic being the most obvious, but only symptomatic of larger effects of the nuosphere and its systematicity, um, do we begin to see an emergent pattern in which the individual voice is absorbed without protest into a larger whole. So I'm, of course, reminded here um, of my favorite science fiction book of all time, Arthur Clarke's Still Remarkable Childhood's, Childhood's End, and its vivid images of such absorption, um, an image that's really strikingly different um, and distinct from those of the kind of photographic aggregates that we associate with fascist culture, the images of you know, Stalin or Mussolini sort of made up out of a mass um, of individuals or, or army members or Red, Red Army um, volunteers. Um, all making the figure of the leader. Um, and instead, in Clark's vision, um, there's a kind of evolution towards a positive ecology of culture. We may quibble with it, but it's not a negative vision. Next slide. Is it the death of Chatterton? Is the coming of the hive mind a genuine phenomenon, or I'm just living in California too long? I have new age cults, uh, uh, pixie dust in my brain. Um, does it signal the death of our long-standing romantic ideology and all that it bequeathed to modernism? Is the neo-post-human not so much a cyborg human-machine hybrid as a new social being whose existence is part of a complex system of connections and relations in which differentiating impulses have begun to evaporate? Gerald Bruns, whose work has also had an influence on this talk, um, writing in, in Ceasing to be Human, describes a very different approach to this um, sort of post-human condition. It's not really post-humanism. Ceasing to be human describes a condition of liberation from the pressures of differentiation, a lowering of the defensive or uh, differentiating boundary mechanisms that police our otherness to ourselves. Now, for Bruns, this is all positive. It's a way to feel a oneness with the world that corresponds to the discussions of new materialisms. I don't know how familiar you are with new materialisms, but these, um, the, these theorists posit their post-humanism in terms of an unprivileging of human consciousness and sentience in favor of a larger view of complex systems. Now, in that particular critical frame, as in Bruns's, our long-standing attachment to a Cartesian cogito was both a symptom and an instrument of a conviction that sentience was separate from matter, that consciousness was other than the supposedly inert stuff with measure, mass, and extent that was counted as the inanimate part of the world. Next slide. The modernist ideology depends upon the myth of the individual voice. The lyric imagination of romantic poetry, the singularity of Keats, of Shelley, of Byron, of Wordsworth, of Blake. Next slide. Like the imagery of Caspar David Friedrich are all emblematically stamped with the image of the one, the individual whose unique and original experience is uttered as a cry into the overwhelming sublimity of nature or against the supposedly crushing banality of culture. As much the result of what Jerome again called the romantic ideology, the product of criticism and literary myth-making, as it was of romanticism itself, this heroicization of the individual voice has been taken apart repeatedly. Even in 1846, Edgar Allan Poe's philosophy of composition was a systematic exposure of the measured and calculating work of creative writing, a clear-headed rebuttal of romantic inspiration and imagination. Next slide. But how do we put a work like this one of the collective hush into that modern tradition? Given the privileged status of fine art within the various ideologies of humanism and modernism and the longer traditions into the present, this seems worthy of reflection. The notion of the individual voice may have been shown to be mythic and been equally mythically taken apart. Roland Barthes, 1967, Death of the Author, Michel Foucault's nearly simultaneous What is an Author, stressed the author function as a product of texts rather than the course. The author as a fact is a postmodern standard um, in existence long before David Shields produced his all citation reality hunger and talked about it on the Stephen Colbert show, saying, all art is theft, while Colbert sliced pages with his own citations out of the bound volume. 
But like the author functions of conceptual works, um, all of these things retain their named identity and individual revenue streams and claims to professional credentials and intellectual property. Next slide. The artist icon is the persistent gold standard for individuation in modern times. Whether we're talking about the flagrant bad boy, fly in the face of convention actions of, Lord By of the noble Lord Byron, or the equally upper crust diva technics of Lady Gaga, the continuum is pretty clear in the mold well set. As the embodiment of branding, the sign of individual taste, idiosyncrasy and its entitlements, the artistic individual remains a paragon in the social imaginary. Its romantic legacy is still useful in the culture and certainly in the entertainment industry, of which art is a part. Next slide. But some current works of art demonstrate an alternative approach to the individual, posing the terms of a new paradigm of collectivity, aggregation, and synthesis, and emergent voice in which the I engages with a slippage with the we, while identification and cathexis manage to perform not just an object of collective experience, but a product of group mind, swarm think, hive speak. In We Feel Fine, emotions are culled and tracked in real-time processing of live feeds from publicly available social networking sites. Every phrase or sentence beginning I feel is captured and added to the site, which can then be searched and sorted by mood, feeling, weather, gender, location, and age to get a read on sort of the mass mood. Next slide. As these phenomena appear, they coincide with the emergence of concepts of the new materialisms that I referred to earlier. Now, these, are, these theories are rooted in advanced systems theory and a radical reconceptualization of ways of thinking about sentience and being at a fundamental level. And I'm drawing a lot on the, uh, the work of Diana Kuhl and Samantha Frost, Jane Bennett, and others. Now, these kinds of thoughts um, also have their roots in long traditions, um, the works of Heraclitus and the pre-Socratics, and in more modern form, the work of Spinoza, while also resonating with non-Western approaches to the nature of the world. The concept of post-humanism in this context is not linked to cyborg existence or the hybridization of humans and machines, but rather to an eclipse of the centrality of human beings in our own perception of the world, a recognition that our otherness may not be so unique and distinct as we have imagined. We may have more in common with the rest of the world um, than we thought. Next slide. In coming to a close here, however, I want to bring in one last set of, of thoughts and suggest another aspect to this argument with respect to humanism. The humanism of the Renaissance was something very different from that of the later modern ideologies. The humanism of Leonardo, in which man is the measure, promotes a notion of perception situated within the human experiential frame, one that shifts the reference point of culture and individual experience, next slide, from a the theocratic to an anthropocentric one. Now the hubris of Durer in painting himself an imitation of Hans Memling's um, image of Christ um, is an outrageous, but nonetheless, um, you know, historical demonstration of this particular expression of this particular issue. Um, this kind of humanism remains valid, um, for unlike the disappearance of the egocentric individual voice, the, pers the persistence of the individuated position from which, um, uh, from which uh, to perceive um, is. I'm sorry, I lost a, a, a sentence here, um, from which um, is, a, is, a, is a very different conception. So humanism in this sense is not wedded to the individual talent of romantic ideology, but humanism in the Renaissance is conceived as a set of intellectual, aesthetic, and epistemological observations about situatedness, thoughtfulness, being, scheming, as in the case of Machiavelli, calculating, um, and knowing that shifting the ground from um, this theocratic worldview to one grounded in human values, concerns, and reference frames served a particular purpose. Next slide. Now, the illusions of this human are also evident to us. The blindness of the Cartesian cogito, the limits of rationality, um, the justifications of imperialism, um, global expansion and exploitation, our strivings to control nature, to put ourselves above the other beasts by imagining ourselves outside of the very ecologies that produce us. 
But at its core, that humanistic sensibility offers to us compensation for the absorption of, a, of individual expression into collectivity through the recognition of the value of individuated experience of the phenomena of the world, of culture, passion, nature, self, and others. Next slide. I'll end then with Mark Hansen and Ben Rubin's very elegant piece, Listening Post. This might be my single favorite example of art after the individual voice. The piece channels live data in a manner similar to that of We Feel Fine, and it sorts it and transforms it into LED displays and a synthetically voiced audio. Next slide. The machine speak is completely neutral and genderless. It's always the same in pitch and tone and inflection. And yet it manages to be a poignant performance of our existence in the precise moment when we hover on the edge of that loss of individual voice while remaining witnesses to its expression. Next slide. Humanism and modernism consolidated their ideology around the concept of the individual voice, even subject to the systematic critiques of post-structuralist theory and the deconstruction of myths of agency and autonomy the individual talent remained a crucial and persistent notion, central to the operation of celebrity culture and its branding industries, and also to the fundamental tenets of artistic expression and value, and that remains true. But even as I observe what feels like the beginnings of a substantive, qualitative change in human identity, I feel compelled um, to continue my call for integration of humanistic methods into the design of network platforms for scholarship and creative work. Final slide. Um, these impulses to reconceptualize our humanness in light of theoretical premises, as well as, you know, observation of these new kinds of projects and, and uh, processes, and to try to press for humanistic methods in the automated algorithmic procedural world of computation might seem to be at cross purposes. But in fact, they stem from similar beliefs that essentially we are not as yet able to fully realize forms of human expression rooted in complex systems and emergent processes, but also linked directly to individual experience. So when I look around, I see a startling range of curious phenomena that though they don't align or converge in any simple systematic manner, suggest a change in the way the notion of the individual voice, partly in its artistic expression, is being understood not as a romantic construct confronting an infinite sublime, as in the case of Friedrich on the left, but as an individuated space within networks of communication and emergent systems, as in the image in the listening post and that sort of shadow absent figure. Perhaps we will come to realize that it was not so much in what we have to say, but in what we are able to hear that makes us human. Thanks.